Hi guys, and welcome back to the Craft Beer Channel. And today, we're brewing a pastry stout. The horror. The horror. <laughs> I'm crazy mother. Well, I've never seen that happen. It's like, it's cake when you bring it out. It's a little bit insipid, mate. I love the thought you put into this. I'll just pop down to Costa. Hello, biggies, and welcome to probably the biggest homebrew adventure we've ever had. So, Johnny, we've been on a bit of a pastry kick of late with the channel. We've done what are pastry sours. We've visited on the polo. We've even done what are pastry stouts. We have, I mean, we've almost eaten all the pastry. Oh, It might start to show Oof. at some point, but we've got one more thing we want to do before we leave pastry town, and that is to brew oh. our own pastry stout. So yes, while we were over at On The Pollo, we asked Henok if he would be happy to collaborate with us on a big, bold, sweet, nostalgic, utterly nonsensical <laughs> Imperial Stout. <laughs> and he was like, absolutely yes. Yeah. Yes. But he also said that there are some significant technical challenges. And as somebody who slightly dismissed pastry stouts in the past, I was sort of like, yeah, yeah oh, okay. <laughs> oh, and then, but we, yeah. So at this point in proceedings, Johnny, <laughs> I think it is best if we cut to the Grandmaster himself, the wizard of pastry stouts, Henok or Omnipoyo. Br Bradley, what are you doing? Yeah, it's my dear, Johnny. Uh, stay back, stay back. Wait, that doesn't say pastry town. this table, I think we've come to the right place to talk about how to brew a pastry stout. Welcome to Omni Boyo. Thank you very much. So right, talk, talk me through uh, and sort of how you'd approach Imperial, Imperial Stout sort of grist recipe first. So what's the bulk of the grain and, and what are you adding to add the, the Imperial Stout flavors? It's a good question. I think we are essentially working off of two base ideas. One's for adjuncted non-barrel aged stouts and one's just for barrel aging. And when it comes to non-barrel aged stouts, which I'm assuming is this being a homebrew is going to be. There's not a barrel in the studio uh, yet, no. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, I think that going pretty simple is a good idea um, because the rest will be uh, so challenging anyway. I don't think the base needs complexity because we're probably going to add some adjuncts to Yeah, it. we're going to completely cover it with whatever we add. With a bunch yeah. of stuff. And so you don't want the base beer to compete with the character, the adjuncts that you're adding, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so I would start with a clean, but you know, quite expressive base malt in terms of, you know, the base being maybe an English base malt or something like that. Uh, Marisotto, Golden Promise, Maris something Otter, with a bit Golden of biscuit. Promise, yeah, biscuit. Like try to bake as many layers of biscuit into it rather than as many layers of roast, yeah. essentially. That's the main idea behind that. And then on top of that, add some caramel malts um, and then go all in on, you know, flaked oats to build some more body. And then you start thinking about color and roasts. Mm -hmm. And in order to not get too astringent of an outcome, I think that staying relatively modest on the dark malts is a good idea. Maximum of 10% roasted okay. uh, malts, I would say. What, what's that mash going to look like? Do I have to have a very loose, am I looking for super efficiency or am I looking for, you know, do I mash high and try and get loads of body and a high F FG in? That's a good question. Like I would mash as thick as your setup allows. Right. So depending on what you have, what you're working with in terms of equipment, I would go as low as one to one grains wow. of water, which is the thickest I've ever mashed. I've only done it once on a commercial level. We can't do that here at the brewery, unfortunately. That's also why we boil for longer and we have a lot of other things to kind of compensate for that. But as dry of a mash as it could possibly as make. As dry as you dare. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, that will mean that we can fit more in. So we've got basically a 40 litre vessel. Yeah. And we want to try and make about 40 litres of beer, which is going to be another technical challenge. Yeah. We might have to do like a reiterated mash, like. Or double mash. mash. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, to try and, yeah, definitely get to those those figures. Are we mashing, we're mashing in low for as much efficiency as possible? We do possible? that, yeah. 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 So we're doing that to get all the sugar. So how are we going to end up with a high finishing well talk to me about finishing gravity how high does it need to be and how are we going to get there so what did we convert it into so we do uh, the, the beer that we had yesterday yeah. uh, has a finishing gravity of 24 play-doh which would equal 1.1 is that what we said it was? yeah yeah 1.1 1 .1. yeah which is insanely high obviously i think that's probably the highest we've ever gone. I'm glad you think that's insane. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's crazy <laughs> high, which means if you're going to get a beer that's above, say, 9 to 10 ABV, which I think a beer of that sweetness level and thickness needs in order mm -hmm. to cut through that beer, uh, you're probably going to need to be at around 39 to 40 Play-Doh starting, which is pretty intense. Yeah. What we do, though, is we don't actually go into fermentation tank with that high gravity we feed it over one to two days after it started fermenting with just like simple simple sugar sugars or, yeah. yeah and the reason we do that is because we want the yeast to eat those sugars rather than the complex longer chain sugars that actually give this nice big Gloopy mouthfeel that so we're sort after. of distracting the yeast like not that stuff kind of eat this stuff yeah so we're going to feed it like a christmas cake <laughs> Exactly. Uh, it's going to be a Christmas you, cake. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe. I think. Yeah. Now, now we need to talk about adjuncts. So, should we crack what you've yeah, brought sure. along for us, and we'll have a chat about what we can add to these beers to make it happen? Definitely. I mean, I'm particularly, and I'm not alone in that, fond of coconut. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should add coconut. Okay. Good. There uh, we go. This is just one example of a beer that we've uh, used coconut in. Oh wow. Sticky molasses and chocolate, vanilla. It's, it's oily with that coconut kind of character. It's so good. Like once you go above this threshold of, uh, I would say like 30 grams per liter or something in that range, you, you, you start getting this almost fudgy, like nutty fudgy thing going mm -hmm. on, which I, I really enjoy. Right, so you, you, you're recommending we go to 30 grams per liter? I mean, I recommend you try you try at home. I mean, it's obviously how you extract it as well mm -hmm. matters, but we go pretty... I mean, I just don't think you can overdo it in terms of coconut. What you're going to end up with is less beer, unfortunately, which right, makes yeah. the beer more expensive and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's worth it. And so nuts have an issue because of those oils that can damage head retention and stuff like that. So is there any way to counteract that? Or and you can do or you just have to accept that it won't have that I think head. I've just accepted it yep. for these beers. I mean, you know, if a beer comes out and has okay head retention, I'm happy. Right. But it's a, it, a, it doesn't bother me, especially not when it's a higher ABV. I mean, this is the 14%. So other adjuncts that we could use, I know that Brad hates coconut, so I'm probably going to put coconut <laughs> in my version. Um, but, like, what sort of quantities do you have to use of, like, quite expensive ingredients, like vanilla and stuff like that? And is it ever worth using extracts? It is. Um, I think that uh, we are, I mean, we're at a point where I, I, we actually did, made one beer that had the perfect coconut nose and then we added too much vanilla to it and it kind of took away from the experience. It was right. like a weird, yeah, we were, I was kind of weirded out by that, you know, like expensive vanilla going in, kind of like taking something beautiful, something else that was beautiful out of it and yeah. becoming a bit astringent. So you can overdo it with vanilla. I think that sometimes you can also help a beer out by adding extracts. I mean, we make our own extracts as well. Like we essentially steep vanilla in, 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 in liquor and yeah. kind of use those. And then use that liquor. Yeah, yeah. so it's like, uh, it's either how you extract it, but also kind of what you use. So that's all the questions, I think. There may be some emails coming to you about making tinctures at some point or how to feed a beer with sugar. Um, but now we're gonna go back to the studio. We're gonna brew that beer, maybe double brew it, and then decide what extracts, uh, what adjuncts, and what tinctures we're gonna be adding to mine and Brad's beers. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Pastry stouts, mate. Mind yeah. blowing. I, I never thought I'd say it, but pastry stouts are the future. Well, they are our future because obviously we have to brew this beer. So if you want to learn more about Om Poyo, you can watch the full documentary we made up here. But now uh, we've both been thinking about what our pastry stouts could possibly be. We both want yeah. to brew one each. Yeah. Have you had any thoughts about what, what pastry stout you're going to do? Any inspiration from Sweden? 
Big time, mate. So you know I've got a massively sweet tooth, so this plays into the sort of Bradosphere. It's <laughs> the Bradosphere. The Bradosphere. Oh god, that's going to become. A oh, thing. so uh, mate, I, I can't think of a better way, a more diabetes-ridden way, <laughs> to start your day than <laughs> a sort of Swedish cinnamon roll. Okay. And an iced coffee. Cause I wasn't I don't, expecting that. I don't like real coffee, Johnny. No, you don't. So I only like iced coffee. Cold coffee or Milky death. iced coffee. Sweetened? Of course. Of co right, okay. So I'm talking like a sort of latte, iced latte. Yeah. So I brought some inspiration. Okay. Uh, I've got iced coffee here. Other iced coffees are available. I should hope so. And I've also got, let's face it, it's not quite as beautiful as a Scandinavian cinnamon roll. It's a little bit insipid, mate. I love the thought you've put into this. I'll just pop down to Costa. You've got like a really non-cinnamony bit there. What do you reckon? I'm going for it. Oh, don't we? Where a spot of that, doesn't get much better. Okay, so so in beer terms, we're talking, we're talking coffee, obviously. Yeah. Milkiness, so probably lactose mm -hmm. and sweetness. That, sweetness. That checks off that. Right. And it's incredibly like sugary and you're just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. Okay, so lots of lactose. That's what I'm that's what lots I'm taking. Lots of lactose, from Johnny. That. Lots yeah. of lactose, mm. cinnamon, coffee, vanilla. That's my bag. I mean that does sound quite delicious. <laughs> uh right, do you want to hear about my beer? Not really. Yeah, of course I do. So mine, I think my, you know, the romance of Brad's breakfast. If you've ever been lucky <laughs> enough to have a breakfast with Brad, then maybe you have seen some romance. But my inspiration is coming. From the, this. The bad boy bueno. The bad boy bueno. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So, oh, smells so good. Are you sniffing chocolate bars now? That's how nerdy we've got. Oh, man. But I always, I never, I don't forget how good these are, but they always overwhelm me yeah. on how amazing they taste. Now, this is a wonderful chocolate bar uh, and was, in fact, the inspiration behind my wedding cake. Nice, nice. So, what I want to do is I want to make my wedding cake in beer form. So hazelnut, yes, cacao nibs, mm -hmm. vanilla. Right, okay. That's what I'm thinking. Nice. And that will hopefully recreate that flavor. And also, no fucking lactose, because in a tribute to my wife, who can never drink these pastry styles because they always have lactose in, yeah. I'm going to leave the lactose out because she is dairy free. So I've got a lot of sourcing to do. I am not going to scrimp on this, Bradley. OK. I'm going if high we were, end like Henock. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we were going to make money this year, we're not anymore. I'm also going to come up with a grist recipe, mm. a malt bill that's going to complement both your cinnamon costa swirl and my obviously much fancier Kinder Bueno. <laughs> um, and see what I come up with that's going to have biscuity character, maybe raisiny, Danishy kind yeah. of vibes to it, nice. but then obviously chocolate, coffee, toffee, caramel, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm going to take a lot of inspiration from Henock for that. Okay, so it's been a day since Brad and I got very excited in this studio about our pastry stouts, and I spent all of today processing what's about to happen in here, because I don't think there's a single process in this brew that isn't going to be new to me. Now, when we make homebrew content on this channel, the reason why we didn't do it for the first eight years of our existence is because we didn't consider ourselves experienced enough uh, or just good enough homebrewers. Now, I now consider myself a very good homebrewer, but I have never tried an Imperial Stout. I have never tried a beer with this higher OG. I've never tried a beer with this higher FG. I've never tried a beer with this higher ABV. Um, We've got to get, to get two beers out of this, it's going to be well over 20 kilograms of malt, which won't fit into that. Um, it's then going to be 40 litres of this huge beer that I've got to ferment um, with a huge pitching rate. I've then got to add a load of ingredients that I've never worked with. Goddamn hazelnuts, cinnamon, coffee we have used, but not in these quantities. And then cacao nibs, you know... So while I consider myself a good home brewer, while an Imperial Stout, you know, in and of itself wouldn't be that great a challenge, I've got the sort of the technical know-how to do that. There's so many things being thrown in to make this more complicated. And I think 
now that I've sat down and looked at it, I've been hugely <laughs> naive about whether I can actually do this. So this video is not going to be like our other ones where we go, this is how you do it. This is going to be, how do we do it? I have no idea whether this beer is going to turn out right. Um, and that means a couple of things. A, it means I've got a lot of thinking to do about this. B, it means that I've got a lot of drinking to do about this. And C, it means that this is going to be a three-parter. So we'll see you next week as we finalise the recipe and do the brew day. And then episode three, we hopefully have a successful beer and a big old surprise. And then I didn't... And kilograms of grain is about to go in to the already mashed in mash maker. Let's do this. That smells vanillary, blimey, that's exciting. <laughs>